so we've just uh, started the recording and uh, thanks everyone for, for joining us and uh, we've got Varinder Unlu here. Hello Varinder. Hi, hi Marek. Yeah. Hi everyone. Thanks, thanks a lot for uh, agreeing to do this webinar. I, I really appreciate it. And uh, Varinder has worked in, in ELT for 24 years in different contexts, in private language schools and higher education. And uh, she's been the Director of Studies or the Academic Manager since 2002. And she's now working at IH London. And she's been there since 2010. And she, today's webinar is about recruitment uh, policies in ELT and about hiring the best teachers. And um, I'd also like to thank uh, James Taylor and Belka, the Belgian English Language Teaching Association, for making this series of webinars possible. Um, so thanks a lot. And uh, if you're in Belgium, if you're around, uh, then come to the conference in April. And uh, they're doing their own webinars as well every month. So you can check out the website, Belsa, and uh, maybe attend some of their webinars. And uh, uh, so thanks a lot, Varinda. The floor is yours. I'm going to disappear. Lovely. And, uh, looking forward to this webinar a lot. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you. Can, I, can everyone hear me now? Hello? Right, okay. I hope you can all hear me and um, I'm looking forward to presenting this to you. Today's talk is um, about NEP, um, a discussion that's been obviously going on for some time um, and uh, it's about fairer employment in, in ELT. Now, you'd think it would be quite a straightforward thing, this sort of employing teachers and being fair about it, but it isn't always that straightforward. There are a lot of questions we need to be asking. Um, and one of the reasons it's not so straightforward is because there are so many stakeholders involved. Um, and the stakeholders are parents, employees, school directors, agents out there as well. And, and they all have their own set of ideas of what an English language teacher should be. Um, and this is made even more difficult if you're working, uh, living and working in the UK as well, because people have uh, a, a whole different idea of what an English language teacher should be when they arrive in the country. So that's what the talk is going to be about today. We'll, be, uh, we'll start with a discussion and um, uh, hopefully you can join in as well at some point. So, um, right, okay, so first things first, I wanted to start off with a free circle categorization of English. This is Patrick's three circles of English. We've got the inner circle uh, countries where uh, it's an L1. So you've got 375 million people speaking English as a uh, first language. You have the outer circle countries where it's English as a second language, where you've got 400 million people speaking it as a second language. And then we've got the expanding circle countries where it's ESL, English as a foreign language. And that's at one billion plus level. Um, can anybody, if, if you want to take a guess, who do you think is in the inner circle countries? Can it, does anyone know? Do you want to type up any answers? I mean, we've got some, some people typing that. Yeah, uh, UK, yeah, <laughs> UK. <laughs> yeah, any other countries? Australia, yes, okay. UK, India, no, not India, unfortunately. Uh, the inner circle countries are uh, the UK, US, Australia, Canada, possibly as well. So those countries where English is the first language. Then we've got the outer circle uh, country where it's the second language, and that's where we would, Ireland too, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we would have, um, in the outer circle countries, it's places like India, Nigeria, uh, Jamaica, so where it's spoken as a second language, where you know, these countries were colonized by the British at some point or uh, another English speaking country, so therefore they speak it as a second language. Um, Kate is asking, is there not the official language in India? Uh, yes, it is, but it's still a second language. It's not, it's not the main language. Hindi is the main language there. And then the expanding circle. The expanding circle is the rest of the world, really. Um, so, you know, from Italy, Russia to China, it's, it's everyone out there that's learning it as a foreign language. 
So we've got all these different uh, types of English deep spoken in different parts of the world. Um, and learning and teaching English, as you all know, is, is big business. It, it is a business, and we have to really think about it as a business. Although we are teachers and we like to think that um, you know it's all all lovely as teachers, there are people involved in the industry who are trying to make money, and that at the end of the day is a really important uh, thing to uh, remember when we are looking at um, teaching and learning English. Um, so those three circles, moving on then, so looking at ELF and English as an international language. I mean, this was um, this is an interesting thing that uh, was written in 2010 about uh, uh, ELF and English as an international language moving on. Terminology is moving away from native speaker and non-native speaker um, like language and consideration is being given uh, to the ways in which English is used in everyday communication. Well, um, yes, so many people wanting to uh, are wanting and needing to learn English. You know, it's it's important that we do look at the way people are speaking, and there has been a lot of discussion about um, about the kind of English people are speaking. Actually, I've just missed one of my slides. I'm so sorry. I'm going to have to go back. Oh, it's, right, it's in the wrong order, sorry. Okay, so we do need to be giving this a lot of consideration. Um, what What is uh, the native speaker uh, level of English and the non-native speaker level of English? We'll come back to that in a little while. So before we move on to discussing um, English as a, 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 a better language, let's have a look at what we think the qualities of a good English teacher should be because obviously when, when I'm employing an English teacher I have some ideas in my head of what an English teacher should be and what they uh, are should be capable of doing. Um, can you just uh, for this bit can you just participate and um, see if you can write down some ideas of your own what do you think? Okay so we've got motivating the demotivating There is no right answer or wrong answer here, so I'd, I'd just like for you to give me your ideas on what you think uh, are um, resourcefulness, okay, empathy, creative, motivated, persevering, dedicated, okay, ability to motivate students. Good moderator, able to reflect on his performance, yet good role model for learners, language awareness, enthusiasm, humor. <laughs> language proficiency. Hmm. <laughs> okay, is language proficiency not a quality then, um, you think? Sensitive to learners' needs, C1 or C2 level of English. Qualification, it is, yes. Hmm, okay. Well, I mean, there is, we, we actually did this exercise in the school uh, a few years back now. We thought um, we asked the teachers and the students. Uh, to come up with a, what they thought um, a good English uh, teacher is, what a good English language teacher is. And of course the teachers all had similar sort of ideas as yourselves that you've just, um, uh, the examples that you've just given me. So, you know, adaptable, creative, engaging, uh, organized. Actually, I would, I would actually put organized in there as well. Um, for me, as a, um, employer of teachers, I want teachers to be organised in that they're able to do their administration and they're able to uh, fill out their forms, etc. And I also want them to be cooperative as well, so I would put that as one of my top ten uh, qualities of a good English language teacher, because being cooperative doesn't just, uh, it's a very important part of um, the staff form and being able to uh, 
uh, get on with other members of staff, not just other teachers, but also administrative staff. And uh, you know, you've got uh, we've got a very big school, so they have to be able to uh, talk to everyone and understand what everyone else is doing as well. So it's a really important uh, uh, quality there as well. Um, so all of these, all of the things that you said, those were the things that the teachers mostly came out with as well at Fire Hate London. Um, with the students, it was slightly different. The students uh, were more focused on the level of language. They were more focused on where the teacher was from um, and uh, how well they spoke as well. So it, you know, it kind of doesn't match up to what we what we think as teachers, what a good teacher is, because the students have their own ideas of uh, what an English teacher should be and should look like. Um, and that's that's where it gets quite tricky when it comes to employing teachers as well, because we have their expectations to meet, and we've got our own ideas as well of um, what we should be doing as a school or as an organisation, and how we should be employing people. As a okay, Diana's asking as a manager, how do you balance your students' requests and what what you think? Of the teacher is. Okay, well we're gonna come on to that in a second, Diana. We'll be um we'll be discussing that in a little while. But it, it, it's a really important question um to answer and we uh, as employers need to be ensuring that we do meet their expectations, but however at the same time we're not um just uh pandering to everything they say as well. So it, it, it but there is a slight difference there as well. Okay, so moving on from that, that was a, it's an interesting uh, discussion to have, and it's a, it's a much wider discussion as well, I think. Um, and uh, changing student perceptions of what an English teacher should be is going to take a while. I think it's not going to happen overnight because they do have these ideas, and the, as Tyson just said, their expectations are shaped by their previous experience. Yeah, it's not what. what Best necessary. Absolutely right. I completely agree with that. Um, so going back to oh, the slides are all in the wrong order now. So I'm so sorry. Just one of the slides is now gone missing. We did check these earlier, and they're all there. Okay. So what we were looking at in, in one of the slides earlier, the health and the English as an as an um, international language, um, if you look at this slide, Stakeholder, Binkman and Jenkins, um, and other critical linguists have outlined the case for the EIL and ELF model for teachers and learners. However, Jenkins concedes that to date the ENS model remains the norm, so um, the English native uh, model remains the norm uh, in English language education worldwide. She blames this on the gatekeepers, such as governments, institutions, examination boards, universities, publishers, the British Council, and other British and American cultural political institutions as well, such as the English only institutions. The pressure group campaigning for official status for the language in the USA. Since the elders control English language policy decisions, she contends that the dominance of force use advocating the ENS model impacts on attitudes and beliefs of non-gay teachers, including NMES teachers around the world. Jenkins further argues that the activity of these gay teachers conspires to promote a particular view of good English and good English speakers, and to have a malign influence on teachers, both nests and non -meds. Attitudes towards English language teachers, which in turn lead to linguistic insecurity among non-native speakers, um, so we, you know, this is this is a really important uh, this is a really important point. Who are these gatekeepers, and why do they insist on having this model uh, of English that we, you know, are trying to move away from the English native speaker model? Uh, we know now that more and more students are actually speaking their speaking English, which is of a completely different way. Um, so when, when we look at um, uh, the kind of English that is spoken outside of England or outside of uh, America, outside of Australia, students have created 
uh, their own way of communication. And often we find that it's the native speakers who are unable to understand them, uh, understand and join in that conversation. So um, do we want to be insisting on English native speaker type models when we are thinking about teaching English? Um, this research was, I mean, this was written in 2010. Uh, I took this from, uh, a book from, uh, so that was written in 2010, and things have moved on since then, as we know, um, and people are now uh, changing uh, their views on what the normal is in English language learning and teaching as well. So I think that's really important to remember that people are actually now starting to uh, become a little bit more aware of English uh, as an international language and else too. Um, and this will, this will be uh, something that's going to affect how we do uh, teaching English in the future as well. What kind of English we teach and what level, to what level we want to teach English as well. Um, not all students want to be proficiency level. Uh, they just want to be able to communicate with, uh, with other work colleagues, uh, or colleagues around the world at a level that they're all at. So that's often around a B2 level, which is, which is around what upper intermediate. Um, so this kind of um, fallacy, this, this, this kind of belief that, teach, that students need to be at native level to be able to communicate is wrong as well. What we got from here. So let's have a look. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to go back because these slides have got a little bit mixed up. And one of them completely gone. <laughs> okay. Uh, one of the slides has completely disappeared now, unfortunately. So I'm sorry about that. I was going to actually show you a slide of uh, an, an advertisement taken recently uh, from a school in uh, Japan. Um, it's a very big organization. Um, and it's a school called NOVA. Uh, and they have um, advertised for all instructors to be native speakers. Uh, which is quite a common thing uh, that you see uh, in the first month as well. So these these are some of the websites uh, that I looked at, and just in, while I was researching and um, while doing this, uh, preparing this talk, just to see what's out there. And this is recent. Uh, that's the most upsetting thing about it. This is very recent. That these um, uh, organisations. If you look at some of the jobs that they are um, advertising for, you've got looking for native English preschool teachers, native speaking English teachers in Tanzania, uh, native speakers in Taiwan, native speakers in you know, so many countries across the world that it, it's quite appalling really um, that people are still advertising in this way, even though so much more awareness has been actually raised. If we look at the Keppel.com, this is another one. This is another big recruitment. Uh, okay, so, okay, so straight away I've got, uh, uh, if I look at this, I've got native level uh, teacher here. Um, if we look down, let's see if they've changed it. Native level, but okay. Now they've actually changed it to native level. So some of them have actually now started training their prospects a bit more. This is a perfect teacher. And if you look at this one as well, again, when you start looking at the investments on any of these um, websites, you'll see that most of them are looking for native speaker level teachers. Um, and that's what is that? What is native level speaker? So when you when you look at this, you do ask a question. The question is why why do uh, students and school owners want a native speaker instead of a non-native speaker to teach them? 
Um, why do you think, I mean, you've, you've narrative asking the question what is native level, but why do you think teachers, or why do you think school owners and students want a native uh, teacher to teach them? <laughs> what do you think the answer to that would be? More comfortable with the language? Possibly. Do students think that a native teacher, just because they, they are, their first language is English, they are a better teacher? Would that be the answer? Do you think that teachers, do you think that students actually believe that if you are born in the UK and you look a certain way, that is the for the best kind of teacher for them. The majority think that when you have the perfect action, you're the perfect school and to in their clients, not necessarily some native teachers. Yes, of course, I mean, we'll come to that as well, whether it's necessarily the best, whether they're necessarily the best teachers. But what, why do you think students and school owners want native teachers? Some interesting ideas coming up. We we'll nurse them in this issue of culture. Do you not think that a non-native teacher could do that? Do you not think that a non-native teacher can uh, nurse a student into the culture? Not successfully. Okay. Um, well, I mean, I think the, the belief is with most students, as I said to you earlier, when we were looking at our uh, the quality, what what the qualities of a good teacher are, the belief is that if you are a native teacher, you are going to be the best teacher for them. It doesn't matter uh, uh, whether you have a qualification or not in some cases as well, actually, you'll find that they'll just have more confidence in a certain type of look and a certain type of uh, 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 accent and um, they, their belief is that that is the best person for them. So from from the students, this is kind of coming from the students. And then, of course, we've got the school owners, the directors, who are also then pandering to that and allowing um, them to lead uh, in that, with that belief that it's only uh, native teachers that can teach uh, them English in the best possible way. So, you know, it's, it's a really difficult um, conundrum, we need to be looking at uh, changing, how do we change, how do we change students' beliefs, how do we change what they actually have in their heads from, you know, it goes on from previous you know, educational experiences um, and how can we actually try and change what they're thinking and how they're thinking about non native teachers as well. That's a really difficult thing to do. Um, and I can give, I will give you lots and lots of examples in a while, and I, you know, I come across it uh, quite frequently where students do come out and complain and, uh, about certain teachers saying that they, they don't think they're actually able to teach them the kind of language they want to learn. So we need to be addressing this issue, and we need to be looking at um, why they still believe that and why, why how we can change that. Um, the one thing we, the one thing I do at um, IH London is we do have a job description. We have a person specification for a teacher, um, and uh, nowhere in that person specification do we have um, anything about where the teacher is from. Uh, we we just outline what we want the teacher to be able to do, um, and so that's basically, uh, you know. 
hair less than antiques, and obviously they were served and they've got to have a, a, a certain level or a certain quality that, about them as well, that they, they can connect with the students and uh, work well with their colleagues as well. Um, is this something that you would have in your schools as well? Do you have a job spec? Do you have a personal specification for your, uh, uh, you know, when you're employing teachers? Is there something that you have as a lack of checklist of things that you think, okay, these are the qualities that we're looking for in these teachers? Do any, are any of you involved in uh, employing teachers? Is this something that you would do? What we also have, I mean, maybe this is because you live in the UK and I'm living in the UK, we also have an equal opportunity policy as well. Um, and again, you know, I'm not sure what uh, what the laws and regulations are like in the countries we are living in. Um, it's really important that we have an equal opportunity policy and it just outlines that we don't discriminate at all in any way um, or form. And it's uh, something that we have to have uh, it's legally binding as well. Okay. Um, the okay. So looking at recruitment, then recruitment is really, really tough. It's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, getting the right person for the right job can be quite uh, quite difficult because some people are some people look very good on their CVs. Um, uh, and then don't do so well in their interviews. Other people will uh, do very well in their interviews and then aren't so great in the classroom. So it's really, you know, it takes it's a whole process of um, looking through the CVs and the interviews and understanding people and trying to pick the best people possible for the job. Um, what we do is in our school, we've got um, a HR department. Um, we're lucky enough to have a HR department and we we share the responsibility of employing teachers in our school. Um, so the applications with CVs, I mean, where are they stored in your school? Who actually uh, keep hold of those? Is it you as a director of studies or is it uh, the HR department or is it senior teacher who actually manages the application forms in the CV? Um, who's responsible for shortlisting them? What are you looking for in a prospective teacher? What are your starting strategies and objectives? Who does the interview? What does the interview involve? So these are all questions that I would be asking um, any one of you if you're, if you're looking at employing, if you're working with employing teachers. With us, uh, the majority of the CDs and application forms uh, are stored with our HR department. Um, and then they will shortlist for me uh, the best CVs out of those. And it, you know, it's just it's not a matter of um, looking at. We don't we don't require photos on the CVs. We don't um, ask people where they're from. We just ask them to send their CVs, and that's it. So with all their qualifications and their experience. Um, so they will shortlist all of the CVs for me, and then I will have a look at the shortlisted CVs, and from those I'll shortlist them further to uh, invite uh, the teachers in for an interview. Um, what we what we do is um, the interview process is 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 uh, quite lengthy. So um, before before the candidates come in, before the teachers come in to be interviewed. Um, I send them out a task uh, from uh, I think it's uh, outcome up in the media. It's a reading task, uh, a reading lesson that I uh, send out to them, and they have to write a lesson plan around uh, the reading task. Um, when they come in for um, an interview, they actually have to talk me through the lesson plan uh, and tell me why they are doing the things they're doing in. On, on, in the lesson plan, and I, so that they have actually sort of explained it and looked at it and understood it themselves as well. Um, and that is probably the best way of employing someone, just getting them to write out a lesson plan rather than get, asking them 20 questions about um, why they've applied for the job. Because that really actually um, separates the strong from the weaker teachers as well. 
So we've got the lesson plan and then we'll ask a few questions uh, uh, which are sort of related to teaching and find out what their background is a little bit about where they've been teaching and how long and things like that. The usual stuff that most you know employers do. Um, we always, always have two people involved in the interviewing process. Uh, I never do I never interview anybody by myself. Um, simply because it's just nice to have a second opinion on people as well. And that that has worked so much better for us. And this is something that I changed uh, about three or four years ago. I, I was saying that, you know, we always do the interviewing in pairs. We find out um, uh, what the other person thought after the interview as well. And, uh, and the lesson plan, as I said, is, is the biggest part of that uh, job application. Um, because I, that really, for me, um, as I said earlier, separates the weak from the strong. Um, we do have a really wide range of uh, interview questions as well, and they're all aimed at experience. Uh, it's basically, you know, obviously we take into consideration if someone's fresh off the set or less experienced, we wouldn't give them really difficult questions, but uh, most of them are based on just the level of experience they have. So um, we will ask questions about language, we will ask questions about you know uh, what they would do in certain scenarios and certain situations as well. Um, and that again, you know, separates the weak from the strong as well once we've done that. Um, I'm just having a look at some of the conversation that's going on as well. Is this policy of your school is using that most language skills quite Diana, I think um, not all schools follow this policy. Uh, I think most schools uh, how can I put this? Uh, I think most schools that are uh, sort of well small the smaller schools will actually go with just the interview. Um, and I think there are there are quite a lot of schools that probably wouldn't invite teachers with uh, uh, who you know a, who don't have a native name at the top of their CV or on their application form as well. Um, but I do know a lot of the bigger schools do um, have a, some kind of interview process that they go through, and that that is you know really. It's usually the bigger organisations, not so much the smaller ones. Um, America's just put something up about um, something that offer the equal employment opportunities with less than one less strong. It's on the uh, top right, FTG advocate's website as well. You've got the link up, you can have a look at that as well. Um, with us at IA funding, we do have a real mixed bag of teachers. Um, we've got, uh, we've got obviously, I, I would say the majority are still native speakers, um, but we do have uh, teachers who are non-native, but they, you know, they've uh, they've lived in the UK for years. Uh, uh, they, we have teachers who are non native who have not lived in the UK for years but have taught abroad as well. Um, and it's quite interesting that um, we do we do get problems with students um, asking a why 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 their teacher is not native. I mean I had a uh, we've just we've got an Italian student uh, we have an Italian teacher who teaches English. He's an excellent teacher. He's been working as a teacher for years, um, qualified, no I, I would say, you know, probably one of our best teachers. Um, and not so long ago uh, he had a problem with a particular student who uh, refused to go into his class. Um, and made such a big deal after saying that that was it. She wasn't going to uh, she come all the way to England, to London, to learn English from an English-speaking teacher, not a teacher with an Italian accent. Now, this teacher's accent, it, it, you can barely hear it, actually. Um, but the student obviously felt uh, 
upset by the whole thing as well. And uh, it was quite upsetting for the teachers too. I mean, uh, it's, it's horrible for for me to go back to a teacher and say to them, "I'm sorry, look, you know, um, we had this complaint uh, from you. Know, how do you deal with complaints like that? That's interesting." <laughs> um, well, it normally go back to your class. Um, all our teachers are, are qualified. They're all um, they all get observed. We have no problem with uh, the quality of the teaching from this teacher, um, and it's actually your problem and not ours that you can't understand that you know you're learning from this teacher. You're learning exactly the same thing from this teacher that you would be learning from a, a native teacher. So I always send them back to class. Um, and make sure that you know they understand that. And more often than not, actually, they uh, they do come around to the idea of um, having a non-native teacher, and uh, then actually really love their teacher. So it it's a matter of just saying no to them. And I think if you keep saying, "Oh, all right, that's fine. I'm really sorry," if you're apologising to them. And saying, I'm sorry, I'll move you out of that class and put you in, into another class where the teacher is a native teacher. So then you're actually accepting their uh, uh, narrow mindedness in, in some way as well. So it's really important that we re educate students and make them understand that um, what they're getting is a good quality uh, level of teaching from whoever we have in the school. We wouldn't be employing teachers. In our school, who couldn't teach, and that's a really important point to get across to to our students. Um, otherwise, I would have every student at my door daily coming to me saying, "I don't want to be in, in this teacher's class because she is from, uh, you know, Spain, or I, I don't really understand why I have to be taught by this teacher." So it's really important that we send them back to class and make them understand that their teachers are up to do. Um, we do get we we have had cases because we have the one student we have one student uh, well, sorry not one student we have a teacher who is um, uh, his parents are from Pakistan so he uh, but he I think he was born here he was born here but he he doesn't live English no, he lives Indian he lives Pakistani you know so uh, that's the uh, he just looks different, um, and we've had a problem uh, with students not accepting that as well because, uh, again, that becomes a bit more of a race thing because the teacher himself, I mean, he's, he's, he has no accent. His uh, English is at native speaker level uh, or, or native. But he's, all his education has been in this country, um, and the only problem is perhaps the color of his skin. Um, and that has been an issue at times. Um, it's an issue that I've had to deal with personally as well um, over the years where students have actually requested uh, white uh, native English teacher, uh, although I consider myself to be a native English teacher as well. Uh, what we what I did with that one, because it was rather a nasty um, incident, we, we actually asked the student to leave the school. Um, <laughs> rather than put the teacher through uh, torture with this person, because the, per the student definitely didn't want to be uh, in this teacher's class, and I was not going to move her out of the class and move her into a uh, uh, a class with a native white teacher, it, it, the decision was simple. You know, you either go back to this class or you can, here's a refund and uh, you can go and find another school. Um, and she chose the refund uh, and decided to leave the school, which was absolutely fine because, again, from our students, that's not the kind of behavior um, it, that is acceptable. We're called International House. <laughs> and that means it's international in every sense of the word. And we want to ensure that um, our teachers are protected as well. Um, and, and students will understand that, that we do uh, support 
police officers. It doesn't matter where they're from. Um, occasionally, very, very occasionally, there will be a problem where um, the student uh, goes off and complains to a higher um, authority, perhaps the, um, uh, their agent or their parent, um, and uh, then we have to decide what we do in that situation because the, you know, the student has made it into a bigger issue. And very, very, very occasionally, and it doesn't happen very often, um, we do actually move move the student away from the teacher because it's not helping anybody and sometimes you just have to make that decision and um, understand that nobody is uh, benefiting from that situation. So I've got Hadda saying that you get that a lot where you at BC Hadda, yeah, I mean I'm glad that BC are handling it in the same way. I think the more schools put their foot down and say that this is unacceptable, you know, we are not going to change your teacher, we are not going to pander to your beliefs of what a teacher is, but the more this will change as well and students will understand that. Um, and it was actually uh, the other day, in fact, uh, on Friday I had a couple of students come to me and uh, say, oh, um, do you have any Turkish teachers here? And oh, well, actually we don't have any Turkish teachers, unfortunately. Um, but they were complaining about another school where they, there was a Turkish teacher teaching them in English. Um, and uh, I had to explain to them that's quite normal. Um, you know, this is what normally happens. A lot of schools do have teachers who, whose first language isn't English. Um, and that we do actually, we would employ a Turkish teacher as well if they had the right qualifications and the right level of experience. In, um, uh, and they have to understand that, you know, it, that's our employment policy as well. So, you know, we, uh, Norma Post does put that, you know, we never put native people only in our job options. But, yeah, IH London, we don't do that. We, we have never put native people only in our um, job ads because it's just not something that uh, we think is important. It's really not important. And, you know, some of our non-native teachers are actually better uh, teachers. <laughs> don't, don't say this to anyone, but they're sometimes a lot better than the, non <laughs> than the native. Um, but I find this, uh, when I'm training on the shelters as well, we find that um, the non-native trainees often have lack of confidence uh, compared to the native uh, teachers where in fact they are often the better teachers because they, they've got the knowledge of the language. You know, their knowledge of the language is much, much better than the native. So it's not about, um, it's really this question of native and non-native should not really exist anymore, unfortunately, it still does. Um, we talked about sort of uh, what the attitude to non-native uh, teachers is, and it is still still the same um, from students. Until they actually go to class and start learning, and they see that their, their learning is exactly the same as it would be with a native teacher. Um, it's quite interesting because once, for example, with our teachers, we've got uh, several non-native teachers at the school and um, once teach students have been with them they will sometimes ask to be put in their classes uh, or go back to their classes because they enjoyed their lessons much more so that, that, always, that always makes me smile. Um, just want to mention uh, the treatment while we have, we talked about that as well, I mean you know, that still exists. There are schools unfortunately that uh, they will do ask for native, they still advertise, uh, even in uh, this, um, what surprises me is Europe, actually, that in Europe they are still advertising for native speakers of English. I, can it's, it's, I, I don't really understand it, but I, I kind of understand why in the Far East perhaps sometimes they uh, advertise in this way because they've got their, they don't have any perhaps laws or regulations where they've got equal opportunities or you know 
uh, that kind of thing. But in Europe, where you've got um, a stricter, stricter laws, stricter rules, stricter regulation, we shouldn't really be seeing so many um, job ads asking for native speakers only or uh, you know, teachers from England or teachers from Canada or teachers from certain countries where it's the first language. Um, okay, so Diana's asking, talking of qualifications, do you pay a lot of attention to the candidate having a Delta or Trinity degree? Uh, okay. Uh, I, I think I'm going to have to be a little bit controversial here. Delta, uh, yep, yeah, Delta, we, we think it's good if it's on the CV, if they have a Delta or a Trinity um, diploma, uh, but it's not something I look for. Um, actually, I find sometimes the more newly qualified or uh, sort of people who have they don't have a Delta and they've got, I've got a year's teaching under their belt, they still have that enthusiasm for it. Um, I work in better candidates, but the Delta, of course, is, is an important um, qualification to have. But it's not something that I would I would uh, be taught by, uh, let's put it that way. It's not something that's uh, a requirement. Um, Delta, Delta, what you do, you know, how you perform at the interview, what you do with the lesson plan, and what you do in the classroom, that's important. Um, from experience, uh, and this is not uh, at IHA Fund because I've worked at other schools as well, I've often found that um, sometimes, uh, you know, people put down all sorts of qualifications on their CVs, and then when you go and observe them in class, actually, doesn't mean anything, their qualifications don't mean anything. Um, and uh, they're actually perhaps not that good a teacher. They're, they're very good academically, but they're not very good at doing the job. And that's really important. You know, we look at the qualities of what we look at what the qualities are of a good teacher earlier. Um, and if they don't have those qualities and they're not able to engage with the students, um, then there's no point in them having a job for you know a PhD in teacher or whatever. Um, for me, it's, it's, the important thing is that the students walk away at the end of their lesson having learned something and actually having a connection with their teacher uh, in some way. Because that's really important that that's where real learning takes place. Um, it's not going to be a certificate or a, a diploma that's going to um, make that difference. So teachers, you know, it's, it's really important that uh, they can see. <laughs> that's more for me. That's that's about it, really. Um, and yeah, we just, we've, I've touched on the nest uh, myths and realities where you know students do feel it's better that they have a native teacher, and they often find that it's not true. It's absolutely not true. Um, and the only way we can keep uh, keep making them understand that this is not true is to keep asking them to give their teachers some time to um, understand what their teachers are doing um, and uh, you know once they once they're back in the class they feel a lot more comfortable and they, they actually don't want to um, change their teachers anymore. So I think that's really important. Um, what we have at the moment now I mean I think for me the problem that's what we're going to have, uh, especially as the uh, as the UK has voted us out of the uh, EU now. Um, employing uh, non-native teachers, uh, the only thing that's difficult is, is work permit, um, and uh, that can take time. And sometimes, I mean, I, I think this is one of the other things that. Um, can affect uh, schools because they they often don't want to go through the process of applying for work permits for their teachers. Um, it, it can sometimes take a long time. So um, 
you know, they prefer to employ teachers that they can just take on quite quickly and avoid quite a, a couple of their time. Um, and that's often the native teachers. And I think this problem is now, unfortunately, thinking about what's happening in Europe and how we perhaps we out of uh, the EU um, is going to become a bigger problem. Um, we will have to start applying, people will have to start applying for work permits. So that's going to be an extra pressure on uh, everyone really to keep uh, a balance in their school of places and their native teachers. And just finally, I just wanted to add um, with most of the world English teachers, most of the world English teachers are non native. I mean, it's over 80% of the teachers in the world that are non native speakers of English. And it's not necessary to have a native like command of a language in which to teach it well. Um, I'd look at what native like means. I mean, we, we put that up uh, earlier, someone put up a question, I think it was Marek, who said, what native level, what native like, um, what do you think it is? Mother tongue level. Well, I mean, if you look at Cambridge, uh, the Cambridge assessment, uh, so first certificate, you've got Cambridge Advanced. Proficiency is C2 level, and that is supposed to be native like, native level. Because that's if you have a proficiency uh, qualification, or if you do IELTS 9, if you get a uh, 9 on an IELTS, you can actually then um, go on to take a self uh, as well and train as a teacher. So that would be the level. And now, that's not mother tongue level, is it? That's just C C two level is not mother tongue level. So everybody's typing, but nothing's coming up. And I think this certificate holder is not native like. <laughs> oh dear. So we've got uh, so a proficiency certificate holder is not native like, uh, doesn't just perpetuate the idea that native native teacher is best ultimately possible. Okay. I've got eight of my old academic using that makes me a good non native teacher. I think the question goes back to um What level are you teaching the student to? So, I mean, I always ask myself the question because I can I can speak Turkish, but it's not very good, and I can probably teach it up to <laughs> A2 plus level, uh, but that's about it. Um, but I wouldn't call myself a Turkish teacher. Um, I, I suppose if you're teaching um, upper intermediate level students, you do need to be C2 level at least. Uh, if you're teaching uh, C2 level uh, students, what level do you think you need to be? It's really important, the level that you're teaching is really important. Um, and that's the question, that's one of the considerations to take in is one of the things to take into consideration is what, what level you put teachers on as well. Um, our Italian teacher teaches proficiency level all the time because he's able to do that. That's absolutely fine. Um, but if, if a teacher is at C2 level themselves, then you've got to take that into consideration as well and how, how well they can 
you know, hopefully we'll see sea level uh, plot. This also seems like major sea level actually speaking of those areas. Yeah, absolutely. That's so true. Uh, what James is just the comment that James has just made. Um, just a, a very uh, just to end uh, before we go, I did actually um, do a, a very quick survey of our more proficient students and ask them wh whether they uh, prefer to have a native or non-native teacher. And, and what they said was um, actually when it comes to uh, the higher levels, they want a teacher whose pronunciation is native-like. Um, the lower levels didn't mind so much. The lower levels were fine. So sort of upper intermediate and below, they, they were absolutely fine. It didn't matter to them whether their teacher was native or not. Upper intermediate plus, so pre-advanced, advanced and proficiency, they started uh, actually thinking that you know they, their level of English um, was good enough, but they wanted the teacher to have English pronunciation. They didn't want the teacher with any other uh, sort of you know they didn't want the teacher with the Italian or uh, um, Spanish or German uh, accent, um, and because they're trying to fine tune their, their their level of English and they want to make sure that they get that you know they get to the level that they want to they do the students who want to get to the proficiency level. So there is that there as well, you know, the, the pronunciation comes into it as well. It's not just the, the knowledge of the language, but also uh, how strong is the teacher's attitude and are they going to be able to teach me um, native like English pronunciation. So before I, uh, okay, so that's the end of the, I'm just like that. We've all got very mixed up, unfortunately. Um, do you, does anyone have any questions? I mean, what I can do is if anybody would like to um, have a look at the job specs or the job spec specification that I use at um, our school and, and the, um, the task that I send out to teachers before the interview. Um, I can forward that to to, to you. We can have a look at that. I can also forward you our equal opportunities um, policy as well, so that uh, you can have a look at that and see if there's anything in that you can take away. Um, does anyone else? Does anyone have any questions? Hi. Hi. Diving. Brilliant webinar. I really enjoyed it. Did you? Yeah, there's lots of discussion going on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that uh, the whole pronunciation issue, if you um, look at that post that I just linked there in the chat, yeah. there's probably like a hundred comments on it. And yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, lots of, uh, a, lot, a lot of disagreement um, about it. But uh, of I, I kind of personally think that uh, you know, um, I mean, obviously you've got to speak the language, but I think um, phrasing it in sort of that uh, you've got to be native-like or native level, I yeah. think misses the point completely because it, it's still, what sort of native speaker are you using as the benchmark? Are you using, a, you know, I mean, I, I don't think it's the, it's the right way to, to think about it. And then it's, it's an unrealistic, I think, um, also an unrealistic benchmark really um, especially, especially in you know in developing countries you know most teachers are b1 at best maybe or b2 but there yeah. might be fantastic teachers you know so yeah there they can only teach to a certain level uh you know b1 b2 if, if that's my level uh for example in turkish and i wouldn't feel comfortable teaching above that level i wouldn't actually feel comfortable teaching at that level Mm. Uh, either uh, I would feel much more comfortable teaching sort of below that level if you see what I mean. Um, so I think there is there there is that question there as well. You know, what can a B two level teacher teach at B two level if their yeah. level of language is yeah? Or what what Kate here asked, can a C two teacher teach C two students? I mean. 
I don't know. I, I, I guess so because if you, you know, if you if you've ever taught C2 level or you know, uh, CPE preparation, mm. even as a native speaker, I mean, your book is just full of notes, and you really have to prepare for those classes because the students are just so good that they'll they'll yeah. pick on every single word that you. It's not that you don't know that word, but maybe that you just you know you don't know how to explain it, or you know you're just learning vocabulary that is yeah. so advanced that. I think no matter what your first language is, you'll have to prepare a lot to teach, you know, um, teach a lot of students. Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of teachers, really experienced teachers, who feel quite uncomfortable teaching at PC level, actually, because they know there's a lot more work involved in that. Um, so it, and they're native teachers, you know, they're, they're not, not native. Um, so it is, it's, it's not about whether they have, it's, doing your research and finding out what you're teaching and understanding the topics that you're teaching and then going in with really well prepared. And um, that's the important thing, I think, rather than thinking, oh, you know, just because you're not native, you can't teach it. I, yeah. I, I think native teachers have a problem teaching. teaching Absolutely, them. yeah. Yeah, I think we should kind of have a more, perhaps, a more holistic view of the, of the teacher, you know, just because I think there's, you know, there's there's an obsession with either native speakers or native-like proficiency, and yeah. you know, being a good teacher is sort of is is has become, you know, equated with being highly proficient in the language, which is, you know, yeah. it's sad really because teaching is so much more. I think. Yeah, absolutely. It's really important that we just, you know, keep reminding ourselves of that. But I think it's that thing about. We need to change the perception, the student perception of what uh, a good teacher is. It doesn't matter where they're from. And, you know, the more we kind of send them back, as I said in the webinar, is the more we keep sending them back and telling them that their teacher is good, uh, the more they'll understand that, okay, it doesn't really matter where they're from. It's actually, the more, the important thing is that they teach me. Mm. Uh, and that's that's been a really important part of my role is that we don't we don't accept uh, anything from the students when they you know when they come in and uh, give us these sort of complaints about oh I don't want this teacher because or that teacher because so always go back to your teacher um, and uh, come back to me in a week's time if you still have a problem and they never do yeah yeah and I think you know this is. This is really the thing that you know more more schools should try and should try and do because I think what it's what you mentioned in the webinar that if you actually um, give in to the demand and start apologizing, then you know uh, you're just perpetuating the same stereotypes and and beliefs even though you know that that teacher is actually an excellent teacher. You yeah. you know you're you're telling the student the opposite by you know caving in to their demands and. And if you think about it, you know, we, we keep on um, dispelling all sorts of other myths in the classroom, right? When a teacher, when a student comes to you and says, oh, teacher, you know, I will learn without any homework and yeah. I don't need to speak English to learn it. You know, you tell them that this is not right. Um, exactly. And that's, that's what we have to keep doing here as well in this instance, is just keep sending them back and making them understand. Yeah. In that way. Okay, well, fantastic webinar. Thanks a lot. And uh, thanks a lot, everybody, for, for participating. And uh, we'll try to make the recording available as soon as possible. And uh, we'll share it um, on YouTube. Um, and uh, I'll share it on social media as well. So your friends and colleagues will be able to, to watch it. Great. Okay, thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thanks a lot. Have a lovely Sunday. You too. Bye-bye.